Welcome to Creekside Online. Our mission is to reach the world with Jesus one person at a time, with Christ, community, and compassion. We are so glad that you're joining us today. If it was your very first time, please take a moment to click the link below and fill out the online connect card. We would love for you to stay connected throughout the week and everywhere you go. And the best way to do that is through our church app. There you can watch additional messages and find resources to help you grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's free and you can download it wherever you download your apps. For us, church is much more than just a weekend experience. And we want you to know that there's a place perfect for you at Creekside. No matter where you're watching today, let's get ready for what God has in store for us. Well, I applaud you for coming to this service. We had a full first service too. I mean, it's just awesome, but maybe you still, even though it's 11 o'clock, you kind of feel like me. Another Christmas season has come and gone and you feel a little washed out, feel like that energy, you know, you, you were filled up so much before it came and then suddenly you just feel, oh man, I, I, I could really use some more energy. I could really use some more life and, and good for you. We, that's what we want today. We want you to be here to understand that there is a way to feeling strong really every every day out of the year and we're going to be talking about that in just a minute if you have your bibles luke chapter 2 the end of luke 2 is where we're going to be we've been in that in christmas season but but we're going to look at that a little bit more in in just a second before we get started i really want to just share with you how blessed i feel to be a part of this church family man you all have been incredible thanksgiving man the foster care ministry the missions ministry all through thanksgiving and christmas you all got involved in that and man we overflow into the community with blessings upon blessings to the community. You know, we're blessed to be a blessing, and you all get that, and you demonstrate that in so many ways. So I am so thankful to be a part of this group. A couple years ago, we started the shine sign and praying for unbelievers, and we saw the baptistry waters stirred, and you continue doing that. We see evidence and bless every home. You're still praying for the community, and you're stepping it up to care. This year, we want to be all in on taking care beyond these walls, compassion beyond on these walls. Christ, community, and compassion, that's what we're all about. We want to really be all in on taking his care beyond these walls. Bless Every Home app is a big way that we do that. So if you haven't signed up, you're not part of that app, I pray that you'll do that today. Because once we pour out, we find that God fills us up. It's an amazing thing that happens, you know. Our cup gets filled filled up again so that we can overflow to others. Now it is true. It is true when you give your life to Jesus Christ, there are some surprises. People are often very surprised after the baptistry that it's not all roses. Because I mean, the enemy doesn't like it that you've come to Christ and he knows you've got not yet Christians all around you who've not come to Christ too. And he wants to try to slow you down from giving them the great message that you now have in your heart and your soul. But don't you let him slow you down. You let Christ fill you up to face that enemy just like he faced the enemy and endured and won and rose from the grave again. That's what we want to talk about today. Have a life that has rhythms of thriving, that understand that God's spirit is real, that when we make him first place, he will fill us up and he will overflow in us into other people's lives. But I get it. Maybe you feel like Chippy the Parakeet today. Okay, you'll understand in just a second. Chippy the Parakeet was a story I read from Charles Swindoll years ago, a true story. Chippy the Parakeet was just minding his own business one day, singing on his perch, you know, having a great time. And then all of a sudden, it just seemed like a monster appeared from nowhere and had a personal vendetta against him. It all began when his owner decided that she was going to clean his cage and she was going to do it. She's going to take the nozzle off the vacuum cleaner and put it into the cage. You're getting a little ahead of me, but it's okay. She, she, she put that in the cage, and sure enough, right when she put it in the cage, her phone rang, and she just had to get this call. So she picked up her phone, not paying attention to what was going on. All of a sudden, she heard, Ooh, whoop. And you know what happened. You know, in horror, she hung up the phone, she reached in, sure enough, 
Chippy was gone, and she opened her vacuum cleaner, and there was Chippy, all covered with dirt and soot horribly, so she panicked as a good, as a good pet owner. She picked up Ch Chippy and, and took him right away to the sink and poured water on him to clean off the dirt. Well, all of a sudden, she sees that Chippy is shaking. He's shivering because the water was cold. She didn't even let it get warm. So she decided then she was going to get him dry, and she took her blow dryer out in full force to dry him out. This poor parakeet never knew what hit him. A few days after the trauma, a reporter who heard by word of mouth what had happened, you know, uh, called her up on the phone. She answered the phone. She said, well, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. He just sits and stares. <laughs> you think? Can you imagine? Can you imagine what his life was like for that poor moment? I mean, he was sucked in, washed up, and blown away. And, and I realize that some of you have felt that way in this last year. And I get it. Maybe some of the content in this sermon is the last thing you want to hear. But I'm telling you, what I have to share with you is true. It's true that God loves you and he's always there for you. And he's ready to fill your cup to overflow. And yes, you empty it out. It gets emptied by many things that happen. But he'll fill it up over and over again. What we need to do is be committed Yes, to certain resolutions. Maybe you've already made it the first day of the year. Make these resolutions. You won't do them perfectly, but stay with resolutions of rhythms that we want to talk to you about today. Now, I kind of got the inspiration for the sermon series from a book by uh, a guy I've always admired, Dr. Alan Algram. He and Bob Russell, I told you about Bob Russell a lot. Alan Algram was a big deal in my life. Alan has written a book called Soul Strength, and we had the book out in the Next Steps area. And, and if you make a $20 donation, I encourage you to pick it up. It's a really great book about Christ, community, and compassion. How really to flesh that out in your life so that you have these rhythms of thriving rather than rhythms of just surviving. And so the soul strength is what we're after in this new year. And we'll define the word soul, but the big thing is I want you to understand the bottom line right up front. That's the bluff today. The bottom line up front, friends, okay, is this. Be all in on the rhythms of overflow that we want to talk about today. You know, you can't just sit back and go, well, that's a nice story. It's a nice story about Jesus and these four areas of his life. you got to be all in to see the impact happen in your life. In fact, a lot of times what I do when I look at books is I go to the end, to the last chapter, you know, so, so that you, you know where it's headed and different things. You start with the end at, at the beginning. It kind of shows you things. And his last chapter is on procrastination. So I thought, what, what a perfect topic today to just say, look, today is the day. The biggest thing is we're going to detonate the word procrastinate in the new year. We're going to detonate that word. We're going to stop putting off what's most vital, what's most important for our lives. The things that we said, oh, yeah, I'll be all in maybe in 2025 or 2028. I'll just keep putting off being all in for God when I'm really ready, when my life really gets lined up. No, friends, can I just encourage you to get rid of those things in your life that you've been putting off that you know would show that you are all in for God. Stop putting it off. For some of you, it is baptism. We've, t we've talked about baptism, how that's an initial first step to show, go public. And man, show everybody that you believe in God and you believe it so much, you'll put to, you symbolize putting to death your old way of life and starting a new life with him where he's in the driver's seat. You live by his spirit. You pause when it comes to your flesh and your flesh desires and you let his spirit move ahead of you. You don't listen to the ways of the world and think that's life. No, the world wants to suck you in like that vacuum cleaner and spit you out. It just doesn't do it so suddenly. But it will if you don't understand to put the Spirit of Christ first, His ways, His words first in your life. 
And so today is the day, man, you need to think about getting in community groups. We've got men's groups, we've got women's groups, we've got all these things going on. We're going to have serving expo going on. It's, it's the time to think about really serving God, making a difference, getting the habits in these next seven weeks of being all in for God. And watch what he does in your life. I'm going to teach a class called Life Tools. It's always changed and transformed the lives of people who come through it when they understand how God has shaped them. He's tooled them to do ministry in his name, that they, that they are special. You're unique. Everybody has a purpose. And God wants to do dynamic things, abundant things, overflowing things in and through your life. I, I've often encouraged businessmen to start reading the Bible more and watch what it, how it transforms your businesses. I've had, I, I got this from a successful businessman when I was in my 20s. He says, look, this has really transformed me. It's changed my life. Every day I just take the day that it is, today's the first, and I read that proverb, Proverbs 1. You know, it's 31 Proverbs, so there's always a, a, a proverb for a day of the year that, that you're on. And so you miss tomorrow. Let's say you miss the second. Oh, I didn't read Proverbs 2. That's okay. Go on to Proverbs 3. You'll catch Proverbs 2 next month. Okay? But just be in that commitment. I'm going to start this rhythm of reading through Proverbs, but also you can start a rhythm of reading through the Psalms. The Psalms, uh, Billy Graham did this every day, confessed to it. Every day it transformed his life. Imagine what it could do for yours. Every day he would just times the date by five. Okay, today I'm going to read the first five chat, Psalms that are there. First five, I'll, I'll listen to, I listen to them now instead of just read them. I'll, I'll listen to them. It just gets more firmly implanted in my heart. And then t tomorrow times five by two, you got, I'm going to go five to 10 and then 10 to 15. You see how that works? And then you miss a day again. You don't beat yourself up. You try to be more and more mindful of Christ, but you that next day, you just go right back into that rhythm. See if it doesn't transform you. I just had a businessman last month said, thank you so much for that. It's made all the difference in my life. I'm getting through some of the struggles I was in, and, and my life's now back to that overflowing place again. Get, get this book, get reading the book, but most importantly, I want you to get to know Jesus. Not just getting to know about Jesus, you see, Really, really get to know him. He rose from the dead. He's alive. The Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, that's the Hebrew words for Holy Spirit. He's alive and well. He wants to live and reside in you. He wants to intercede for you when you don't even know what to pray to God. He wants to show you a vibrant life beyond the mundane, beyond this life. But you've got to keep striving, keep the rhythms going. And in that way, you'll begin thriving. You'll be living in an overflow. The abundant life, Jesus promised. In John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. What is that abundant life? It's like a roller coaster sometimes. What is that John 7.37-38 life that we talk about? You know, Jesus said, you believe in me. Streams of living water will flood within your soul. What he meant by that was his Holy Spirit will fill us up. <laughs> it's not so that we can contain it and go, whoo, this is wonderful having all the Holy Spirit, but so we'll pour it out. And then be filled up again. Pour out those special gifts and abilities and blessings that he kissed you. We are blessed to be a blessing to others. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. amen. And you've done a great job with that church family. I'm so proud of you. Now listen, here we are. It's been December. We've read these stories from Matthew and from Luke chapter 2 and the birth. So we're going to finish it off in Luke chapter 2. The, the story about Jesus' life. We don't have a lot between the time that he fled to Egypt and came back. We don't have a lot of knowledge between that and his adulthood. But we have this one passage here when he was 12 years old. In Luke 2.40, it says the child grew. This is Jesus. And he became strong and he was filled with wisdom. Wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. And then in verse 52, at the end of this section today, look at this. It recaps on that. It summarizes, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. And that would be my prayer for all of us this year. It would be filled with wisdom and the grace of God will be upon us. The grace of God will be poured out in us and that God would just keep this continual filling going on in our lives. Friends, in your life, if you got a little shovel and you pour that shovel out, God will pour more in. He'll, he'll fill it back up. Just give him time. He'll do that. Don't put the sour stuff of the world in it, though. 
because you'll get more sour back. You always reap what you sow. We always reap later than we sow, and we reap in kind with what we sow. So don't sow to the world. Sow to the Spirit. Sow to the good things. Luke 2, verse 41, it says this. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. And after the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. Now, don't under, misunderstand what's going on here. It wasn't like the movie Home Alone where you wake up late and made a mad dash to the airport and on a plane realize that you don't have one of the kids there. Similar a little bit, and probably they were all getting their tents ready and they traveled in big caravans during that day. And kind of like, what happened to, uh, and it happens to a lot of parents, my oldest son, Ryan, when he was three years old. You know, I got home. We lived in a parsonage behind a big church building like this. Be like I was back there. And I walked in the door and I said, where's Ryan? And my wife said, I don't know. I thought you had him. I uh, know. I thought you had him. And we're both, Ryan, Ryan, where are you? We can't find him. He's sitting right out there right now. There he is. All right, we finally found him after all these years. Way to go, Ryan. Hey, it's three years old, and of course, the panic that happens in you. I mean, we're living back here. And, and I mean, 15 minutes to find him, and that 15 minutes felt like 15 years. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, all these scenarios are going on through your head, and I run all around the building. I'm yelling his name everywhere. I finally run around the building, and it would be like being behind our building, and I finally find him beyond Racetrack Road watching a bulldozer, <laughs> bulldoze things. I can't, hey, he's a man's man like his dad, right? He's always, I'm going to learn how to run one of those things someday. Um, we're so relieved Friends, that was 15 minutes. Look at this passage, verse 46. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And here you've been sitting in the temple teaching and learning. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Three hysterical days. Maybe they thought, well, our plan A was really good. Then we went to plan B, Jesus, and then plan C. I mean, after all, there's 26 letters in the alphabet. We were going to go to all the plans to find you. We couldn't find And Jesus is like, no, you, you, if you'd have just got plan A right, you know, the other things fall into place. Just like if you get the first button on your shirt right and the other buttons fall into place. But don't you understand how much I love God? If you understand the, the plans that God has for me and I have for him, then it would have just been a, a natural thought. I, I don't think Jesus is being terse or disrespectful here. It's just to him, it's like this is a no-brainer. Don't you remember the miracles? Don't you remember Gabriel and, and everything that he said to you? Don't you remember the star, the shepherds, the wise men? It's just, just isn't it a no-brainer that I would be with my real daddy, my all in all? You get that right. And other things fall into place. But you know, and you read these things of Mary treasures these things in her heart. <laughs> Don't you know that's probably what she told Luke, what she told Matthew. I didn't understand it at the time. Boy, he would say that to us. But I treasured it in my heart until someday I would understand it. That's like so many things in Scripture. We don't fully understand. I can read the same Scripture I read 20 years ago. It means something different to me. I take more time looking at it. And I think intentionally probably Jesus just held back because he wanted to put an emotional impression on her and Joseph that they would never, ever forget. Is God trying to do that in your life? Trying to say, look, the reason why your life's so chaotic right now is because you, did, you didn't get plan A right. You're on plan C, D, E, and F, and, and I'm still going, no, plan A is just put me first. The first command is love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. I'm trying to get you there. 
Because I loved you with that much. And now I'm just asking you to do my greatest command. And then love your neighbor as yourself. That's the second greatest command. You get those things right, you're going to see this rhythm of thrive begin to just well up within you. Hope that makes sense. It didn't to Mary and Joseph. Look at verse 50. They did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. She treasured them in her heart, and her heart began to change. She began to detonate the things that, that maybe caused her so much frantic and anxiety and chaos in her life. And she goes, wait a minute. This is different. This is a different existence. Because Jesus is in our home. And all things are different with God being at the center. Verse 51, he went down to Nazareth with them and he was obedient to them. Again, a little side note here. This wasn't Jesus' disobedience. That's not what you're to conclude there. It's just he was showing his priority was God. And why wouldn't it be God? And that should be our priority too. And here's the lesson, I think, in this, that when you prioritize God, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when others don't understand. When even your parents don't understand, your brother, your sister doesn't understand, your cousins don't understand, your neighbors, your friends, they don't understand. Don't be surprised when you really begin to put God first in your life and other people look at you weird and go, what? What are you doing? All these things bring us to Luke 2, 52. Key verse, again, a summary verse. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Grew in wisdom and stature. He grew in four ways, mentally, physically, socially, emotionally, relationally. He was all in to do his father's will, and it played out in his life in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Let's take each one of those individually, kind of so that we can think about these resolutions, these rhythms that we're talking about in this next year. We need to have a rhythm of growing in wisdom. You know, I love that it doesn't say that he... He, he grew in the rhythm of getting smarter. <laughs> he, he, he grew because he aced his ACT. I'm glad it doesn't say that. It says that he grew in wisdom. You see, knowledge is so much different than wisdom. Wisdom is living out the knowledge that you have. Jesus had eternal knowledge. He was... He was exasperating the teachers of the law who'd studied it all their life. They were learning from him at 12 years old. He knew things. How did Jesus grow in wisdom? Well, he kept applying those things all his life until he was 33. And he finally applied the last thing that I must die for humankind. That's what Philippians 2 says. He laid down his life in full obedience to death, even death on a cross, that God may exalt him to the highest place. That's wisdom. Wisdom is, is maybe reading less and applying more. Somebody said education covers a lot of ground, but it doesn't necessarily cultivate it. You understand? You get where I'm at? Cultivation, you got to plow it, you got to, you got to disc it, you got to water it, you got to disc it some more until you get it fine and soft. That's how our hearts need to become. Meditation is, is really comes from a root word that's, that's, that means a cow chewing on cud. A cow has four stomachs. It chews that ball of grass, goes down, and then all of a sudden you see that ball come back up <laughs> right through its throat. It chews on it some more, grosses you out, yeah, and then it swallows it again to the second stomach. Yeah, That's what meditation is, though. It's, oh, that's, that's scripture. I'm going to meditate on that. This year, I'm going to grow in wisdom, stature, and favor with God. Man, wisdom, what is that? I need more of that. I need to detonate the things in my life that aren't wisdom and make more time for wisdom, which means I need to make more time to put into practice the things of God, not just learn the things of God. And wisdom is putting love for God first with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, I'm surprised you didn't say all your schedule, but that'll happen once you give him everything. 
in our men's groups, I use the four things from Alan's group, delight. What are your delights? What are your drains? What are your, your discoveries from the Bible? What lies do you need to discover that you've been believing that's been messing your life up? What are your determinations now to apply a different standard of wisdom to your life and to move on? Mike Schultz is going to be retiring here January 19th. Give him a pat on the back. Mike's a man's man, man. He goes on a 50-mile bike hike. Yeah, he, he gave her communion if you don't know who Mike is. And Mike's still going to be around. Thankfully, he's still going to be around. Uh, he, I hope he leads many men's hikes in the mountains and stuff because Mike goes 50-mile hike in, in the woods, and, and that's a vacation to him. That's what he says. That's, that's, his, that's his vacation. That's his restful time. But Mike has all these, he has these pithy quips and sayings. One of his, my favorite that he says is, if we believe a lie, it will impact our lives as though it were true. And not in good ways. Do you understand? You believe the wrong things. You incorporate those things in your life. And in the end, you will find it produces bad fruits. It impacts our lives as though it was a true, but it's a false truth. And we need to slow our thinking down and apply more knowledge this year. If you're thinking, man, that third piece of cake and all the movies and comedies, and if I just trust my wife and the church to raise my kids in the Lord, I don't need to be personally involved. You're believing a lie. You're believing a falsehood. You're putting, you're putting yourself as the chief role of discipler in your home, man. You're putting it on a shelf. And you're believing a lie as if it were true. And it'll play itself out in a way that you don't expect. Because you didn't take the time to disciple your kids. The book Soul Strength, again, just points these things out. The determination to discover the lies that we're believing that are hindering us and hurting us. Like, do I really need that coworker to admire me? Or maybe, could I listen to them and serve them more instead of trying to manipulate and do things to get people to admire me? Or is alcohol really what's going to help me survive the stress and anger? Or is it better to talk it out with wiser folks? Is it better to hit my knees and show my dependency on God's spirit more than I depend on that substance? My prayer is that we'd find ourselves learning to be wiser and wiser in this new year, in the application of knowledge. Secondly, Jesus grew in stature. It's talking about his physical health. Our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. Our bodies are important. And so these resolutions that we make to get our temple healthier this year, they're good things. It's not like our body is, is this secular thing that doesn't matter to God. God says, please pay attention to your body. I want to use your body for my glory. I want to use your talents, your gifts in your body, your, your health, your ability to walk. I want to use it in some way to really impact somebody else's life. And you just don't know what your steps and what your hands do that can change a course of somebody's life for eternity. But you got to be healthy to be able to do that. My mom used to always say, Chuck, if you're not healthy, you're certainly not going to be able to raise a healthy family. If you don't put the oxygen on your face first, you're not going to be able to put it on your child. And so you got to get healthy in all these ways. you got to grow in a healthy way in all these areas. John Ortberg helped me realize and understand what Alan Algram later says in his book also. He has this point in here to help us understand that we are not bodies with a soul. That really threw me for a loop. And then I began to study it in Scripture, and it's true. You see... We're going to have a souls that live on forever and eternity, but our, our souls are going to take a body that looks like Jesus' glorious body. You see, we are souls with a body and wills and spirits and knowledge and understanding and hearts. We are not bodies with a soul. Our soul comprises it all. Our soul is the balance here that Jesus is talking about. He was a living, thriving soul, not just a surviving soul. He had all these things in balance of growing in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and men. Like the four wheels of your vehicle. If you allow one wheel to go nearly flat and you just keep driving on that, and then it drives on the rim and all this, and then eventually the axle is going to be affected and the whole car is going to be affected, the other wheels and everything is going to be affected. So the Bible says our temple is very important. It's vital. 
How about stop procrastinating those habits that are destroying your temple? You're not going to live as long as God had intended for you. How do we do this? Well, you detonate those unhealthy practices, and you do it in small ways at a time. You know, I, it used to be I'd, uh, in my 20s, I'd be like, man, I just really blew it on Christmas Eve. I'd go run three times in the week, and I'd lose 10 pounds. But that created a bad habits, man. By the time I was 30, that didn't happen anymore, especially at 40. You know what I'm talking about? And so you got to be intentional about these rhythms of exercising more and eating less. The small things. In fact, somebody said instead of having BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals, that's say, I'm going, to lose, I'm going to lose 15 pounds in one month. And some people do it. They do crazy things that really hurt their bodies. In the end. Instead, just think, you know, this time next year, and I'm just going to make sure I'm in that rhythm of eating less, exercising more, looking at what feeds and gives health to my body. Dave Ramsey talks about it this way. If it's financially that you're struggling now, there's the debt snowball. You know, maybe you have three credit cards, one with 1,000, 3,000, and, and 5,000. Well, what do you do? Do you tackle the 5,000? Oh, I'll get that one first. No, he says create some momentum in your life. Even if the lower one is not as high an interest and you want that, get that one paid off first, and that will create some momentum. You'll be able to take that payment and apply it to the $3,000 one. You'll pay that one off, and you have all this momentum, a snowball going downhill. So it, you see it begins with the small things, the small decisions. And that happens in our relationship with God, too. Jesus said, grow. He grew in favor with God. He grew in favor with God. You know, I think that sometimes the pendulum of grace gets swung a little bit too far. Uh, it's good. You, we matter to God. God loved us so much. He's crazy about us. He died for us. We should understand that. We should know that. He, our picture's on the refrigerator. He wants to adopt us into our family. You mattered him. You need to understand he offers you a free gift of grace. But sometimes we can lean too far in that direction and get lazy. You know what I'm talking about? It's what Paul said in Romans chapter 6. So we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We don't just... Oh, God's a doting grandpa up in heaven, and he's proud of me no matter what I do. Yeah, I slip and fall, and I do bad things, but hey, he, he's got grace for me in the end. And we swing too far on the other side because the Bible also talks about sanctification. It's a process that he wants to be more holy in your life. He wants to be made more, your life to be more like his son, Jesus Christ. And if you're ignoring that process in your life, you're in the wrong direction. You're in the wrong direction. You see, sometimes we make it sound like God doesn't care what we do. But boy, does he. He knows what's going on with the furthest atom from our solar system right now. And he knows what's going on in your mind. He knows what direction your life's going. And it matters to him. We can't make God love us any more than he already does. But we can seek his favor more. And we can please him more. And that was the life of Jesus Christ. Living the overflow life is these rhythms of wanting to please God over and over again. And friends, I'm telling you, summed up, Christ, community, and compassion that you're serving in some area, you're involved in a group where God's speaking into you, holding you accountable. I made an appeal last year that did surprise me because normally our, our body of fellowship overflows, but I made an appeal that we needed more men and say, I, I look and long for the day when I make an appeal for we need more men or women mentors in a certain ministry that we have so many, we have to say, sorry, we got to turn you away. <laughs> it's just, just going to have to find a way to do it in your neighborhood. But I made this appeal a couple times and, and we were surprised. We didn't know why it was falling on deaf ears. Do you know our elders? I'm so thankful for our elders. Our elders say, that, is that important that you would appeal twice, chuck in a sermon? We're going to do it. We're going to get involved. And so two of our elders, who really the Bible says, you know, that's why you delegate these things, because their job should be more in the shepherding and, and praying and setting a direction. But they said, if, if nobody else will do it, we'll set the example. We'll go in, because these kids matter to God. 
Friends, I pray that this year looks different for us. That we're all in on pleasing God and serving. We're all in on this word compassion to our fellowship as well as beyond these walls. Last point. Don't procrastinate doing what's right to please God. And last point. Finally, Jesus grew in favor with people. Man, people loved hanging out with Jesus, right? Well, not everybody. <laughs> the power-hungry religious people, they were curious about him. They sat down to eat with him, but then they were full of jealousy. The hypocrites, they got all wacky around him, right? Did the wrong things. He had to call them out at times. And then they would get mad when he'd call them out or he'd tell them to do the right things. And like the rich young ruler, he walked away from Jesus. Jesus didn't go running after him. But the struggling, the humbled, the broken people, they loved Jesus. Why? Because in him was found all the wisdom and favor and kindness of the world. In him was found God in the flesh. And grace flowed through him. He didn't worship popularity or fame. No, instead, he just wanted to live the truth of God. Get to know Jesus. If it, if it takes the Chosen movie series, the app series to help you get to know him, do, do that. I, I encourage you. It's a docudrama. But man, I've studied the lives of the disciples, and boy, he does a pretty good job portraying them. Yeah, he fills in the gaps in a dramatic way, but it's pretty amazing. And I encourage you to, to get into that. Maybe that will help you. Understand from that drama, man, it shows Jesus is tough. He's tough on him sometimes, but he's also very tender. I'll tell him the truth. And again, he's not after a popularity contest. And let me tell you something. In leadership, nobody is. We're not after a popularity contest, only with God. We want to do the things that please God. My dad, man, he, he was a carpenter. That's what he was. He was a foundry worker, too. You know, like carpenters in the day of Jesus, the word carpenter actually meant you were also a mason. My dad would build a house from the ground up, from the footer. I was laying blocks beside him all the way to pulling the wires and putting the roof on with the shingles. And if my dad shook my hand, even when I was an old teenager and pretty strong, could bench bent, press, you know, 280 pounds, he would literally crush my hand. I'd be like, Dad, stop. He didn't know what he was doing. Tough. Also, I saw tenderness there. Both my mom and dad understood that Jesus has his toughness, but also tenderness. Can we all stand to grow more like Jesus this year? Being balanced. Don't procrastinate in Christ-like community and being in favor with other people and showing the toughness of God to hold somebody accountable sometimes by telling them the truth in a gentle way, in a careful way, a prayed-up way but then also loving them tenderly beyond what they're doing to destroy their lives and they don't see it. Be tough but tender. Bless every home. Compassion action, be all in in the overflow. Be all in being like God. Love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Dr. Algram says, we must admit that to some extent we are where we are because of poor choices we have made and good opportunities we have squandered. What grand project might you be able to start and finish in the next seven weeks that would please God? That's the question I want to leave you with. What is going to be different in your life in seven weeks? Because of the scripture, because you've meditated on it, taken it in, and allowed it to change your life. Billy Graham wrote a book, <clears throat> Nearing Home. I picked it up at the Cove. I've always been fascinated by his life. Mentors of mine have quaked at seeing it. I've never met Billy Graham, but I met some of his family, and it's just, it's, it's, it's an awesome thing, really. It's just these people that have changed the trajectory of a nation in such a powerful way for so many years. Billy Graham grew up at a time, I grew up with Billy Graham at a time when televangelists were really letting us down, you know, but Billy Graham maintained that commitment, accountability level, that that lifestyle, close to Jesus Christ, balanced way that, that changed so many people around him. At the end of his life, he wrote this book, Nearing Home, and I 
I picked it up and read it. He said, growing old has been the greatest surprise of my life. I was taught through my Christian life how to die. He learned. Life is in dying to self. You empty yourself to be filled. And when you're full, you, you empty yourself again. And God will fill you up again. Empty to be filled, filled to be empty. I was taught in my Christian life how to die. No one ever taught me how to grow old. You know, it's hard when you get older. And before those years start in your life where really it's just like, you know, it's not for the faint of heart to get old. Let me tell you, there needs to be a lot of sympathy for those folks really understanding it in my parents' life. Before we get to that point, can't we grow in wisdom and favor with God and man? <laughs> his, his wife, Ruth, you go up to the cove, there's all these things and all these things, and you really get to know them. His wife, Ruth, was this colorful, playful, jokester kind of lady, but also serious. She's a missionary's kid, and, and her life was just fantastic. But she, she had this strange request after she went on this detour route and saw all these cautionary signs of detours. And at the end of the detour, she said she came to a sign that said, end of construction, thank you for your patience. She said, that's it. That's what I want on my gravestone. <laughs> End of construction. Thank you, God, for your patience. And thank you, everybody else, for your patience with me. Because God has been building his son, Jesus Christ, in me all the way to the end. And there were curveballs along the way. There were storms I didn't expect. There were children that didn't do exactly what I thought that they would do. There were health problems I didn't see coming. But thank you, God. Thank you for your patience. Thank you that you finished the construction. You completed the work that you started in me, as Philippians 1, 6 would say. She lived the thriving life. That's what that means. She lived the rhythms of thriving. Growing in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Let's pray. Father, we, we want to thrive. We want to overflow with you in this next year. Help us to think differently, to act differently. Help us to, to have your favor, to please you so that we have your favor more and more. Lord, we know you love us, but help us to please you, to love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love our neighbors as ourselves. Help us to be in community with other faithful people who will hold us accountable and speak truth into our lives so we stop believing the lies that bring destruction into our lives. And Father, we pray that we indeed would take your filling and empty it out because we trust that you will fill it again that you will bless us so that we can be a blessing to others and that this pattern, this rhythm will continue into eternity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We hope the message you just listened to had an impact on you. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week online at creeksidechristian.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Creekside Christian Church. We believe God has something unique to say to you, and our hope is that you feel his love stronger today than ever before. We love you, and we'll see you next time.